in the case of the Eagles, this has been very scattershot. Very looks like they're throwing uh, darts at the dartboard. You're listening to the Jacob Media Sports Network in partnership with AM 1490 Sports Betting Radio. Subscribe to the Jacob Media channel on YouTube for access to all daily sports content. Ah, uh, that's right. Welcome back to the Fix. We are live in the Prop Swap Studios, AM 1490 Sports Betting Radio. And you heard the man. Be sure to subscribe to the Jacob Media YouTube channel. J-A-K-I-B Media. You can find all of my conversations with John daily up on the Jacob Media YouTube channel. You can also find other segments from The Fix on the Jacob Media YouTube channel, segments from The Middle, which you can listen to every day uh, right here on 1490, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., all that and much more. Um, But let's get into more of Josh McDaniel's story. Uh, as John McMullen filled us in on that last night right here on the show. So we'll get to the McDaniels saga and the Eagles saga and all the latest surrounding uh, your Eagles organization now with our NFL Eagles insider, John McMullen. John, how are you tonight, my friend? Good, Brian. How are you? I like the organization. <laughs> little flyers there. Yeah, give a little tip of the cap to the Fly Guys organization. Um <laughs> So what's uh, what's the latest here with uh, the Eagles and Josh McDaniels and anything else? Uh, well, it's still uh, still looking like Josh McDaniels. He's the so-called leader in the clubhouse. Uh, ultimately, as I said yesterday on the show, I think he's going to be the head coach of the Eagles. Um, timing, we'll see. Um, probably not going to be tomorrow because they're going to interview Dennis Allen. Deep into vetting, as a number of people have reported uh, with Josh Daniels, and understandably so because he's got a, a bit of a reputation uh, from his issues in Denver and obviously Indianapolis. We also mentioned that yesterday. And then you have Nick Sirianni today, Kellen Moore. Um, basically, I, I think in its I've continued, I've continued to think this is the Eagles. The Eagles understand there's going to be some blowback here. And I think they're trying to get a vast class, so to speak, of interviews and say, this was our best guy. And I think that's how this is going to unfold. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that. Um The timing of everything. And the Eagles now are one of two vacancies for the head coaching position uh we talk about minority candidates and just in the nfl as a whole not just with the philadelphia eagles but what's the perception right now with how the eagles are going about this process yeah i i mean i I think they're going to take hits from that perspective as well and i'm going to write about this in philly boys on thursday i don't necessarily think it's fair uh but i i think I think what is fair is is they didn't weigh this type of situation because today, just today, you saw uh, D. Smith from the NFLPA come out and talk about um, the lack of minority uh, candidates and obviously no African-American hires thus far. Um, you saw uh, Rod Graves, uh, who, who – uh, is a former executive uh, with the Jets and Cardinals come out uh, from the Wooten Foundation, which is um, very involved in, in, in pushing this league for to towards minority hires, come out with a pretty scathing statement. Um, and, and we go back to um, Eric the Enemy's agents essentially tweeting, look, the Eagles are going to hire Josh McDaniels and um, – they're not happy about it. Uh, another hiring cycle where it at least looks like Eric the Enemy might not get a job. And there were seven openings. It's not necessarily fair that the Eagles get blamed uh, for this or the Houston Texans. Those are the two teams left. 
But you got to be realistic as well. Now, now the microscope is on them even further. So you can talk about Jacksonville and Detroit and, and the Chargers and the Falcons. Um, the Jets obviously hired a, a minority candidate, but it was uh, Robert Sala. Um, it, it, it's not fair. Uh, to let those teams off the hook, but that's life's not fair. <laughs> and those guys got the jump, and they made their decisions. And they might take a few lumps here and there, uh, but people will overlook it. They will focus on these final two highs, especially if they're not minorities. And with the Eagles, I don't think it's going to be. And, again, we look at Jeffrey Lurie's history. He talks the game. He talks progressive politics. He, he does it all the time. He hasn't hired an African-American in this organization as a head coach or coordinator since Ray Rose. That's how long it's been. So you do the math. They're going to hmm. take some hits. Follow John on Twitter at JF Um So who's – Who's your choice now, John? Ha- has it changed if you were doing the hiring? Who should be the next coach? Well, if I were doing the hiring, it, it would be none of the above. It would be, well, Doug Peters. <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, that's as simple as you. What Dennis Allen will be number 10. And I'm going to turn this on you. Okay. You've seen all the names and, and Nick Sirianni today and, Kellen Moore today, Dennis Allen tomorrow, the latest. What is your favorite hire of this group? None of them. I would go do Staley. Yeah, and I said, I, that's what I said on Twitter. If it came down to it, and these are my only uh, choices, I would just elevate Deuce Staley for the yeah. simple reason of um, making that locker room as happy as possible mm-hmm. in a bad situation. Uh, making the organization as happy as possible. I, I mean, it, it's probably not the best way to go about hiring somebody, but we've talked about all the players uh, that have supported Deuce Staley publicly. We've talked about both current players and former players. Uh, so at least you have the popularity aspect of it. Um, other than that, I, I mean, this is not a awe-inspiring class, and obviously – Two of the people uh, the Eagles interviewed got hired elsewhere. Uh, Some of the people they wanted to interview, Brandon Staley, got hired elsewhere. Um, They didn't get an opportunity. Um, Brian Dayball, they uh, wanted to interview, but he he, kind of turned the Eagles down. Um, So it's not – it's not an awe-inspiring class uh, of interviewees. and uh, that's I none of the above. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's that bad. Uh, but if if you put a if you force me to pick somebody, yeah, I'd pick Deuce Staley. John, at, at what point can we look back to and say this was the turning point? And I say this is the turning point in regards to. How organizations, I'll use it again, go about finding their next head coach because it's really a free for all nowadays. And I think there's pros and cons to that. I, I use it negatively, but I, I like how teams are not, you know, only going after the 65 or older guy who's been coaching for 30 years. And that, that felt like the requirement for quite some time, John. And now you see all of these guys never being a head coach a day in their lives and young guys as well, getting all of these chances and opportunities to be a head coach. Where can we look back at on the timeline and say, okay, this is what really changed the dynamic of finding a next head coach. Sean McVay. And I, I, you know, Sean's been a really good coach. I don't want to disparage him. I, I mean, obviously that team has been, um, a somewhat consistent playoff contender back in the playoffs this year. had a hiccup last year, but uh, obviously we're in the Super Bowl. So he's been a a good head coach, but it is a little bit strange in the fact that the best head coaches in this league remain. Look, Bill Belichick is 69, Andy Reid is 62, and I always say ironically is the most innovative coach in football. 
um, despite his age. Probably Pete Carroll will be next. It, he's also 69. It's not to say you have to be old to be a good coach, but there is. We we talked about minority candidates. Now we can talk about ageism. There is a bit of ageism going on when you see somebody like Brandon Stanley, and everybody's looking for the Sean McVay types with uh, the nice five o'clock shadow and the good hair. I I, I don't understand that either. Um, and Sean's, a, as I said, Sean's a good coach. But again, uh, on the biggest stage, he got embarrassed by Bill Belichick, and he admits that. By the way, that's yeah. not that's not an opinion. He admits that. Um, so it, it's not like he's been this turning point as far as way uh, uh, up he- ahead of his peers. It's just I, on some on some levels I can understand because you know the ultimate goal I always say is continuity. So if you hit on a guy who's you know late thirties, um, early forties, even younger, you know Joe Brady got interviewed by the Eagles. He's thirty one years old. Um, you know, Matt LaFleur is another Sean McVay type. He's having a lot of success with Green Bay, but of course you have Aaron Rodgers. So um, kind of the chicken and the egg there, which is it? But nonetheless, if you hit on a coach like that, the thought process is, well, you might have him for 20 years. You might have a Mike Tomlin situation um, where, where you have this consistent success. And I understand that part of it, but there is no formula. There is no got to be. A, it's got to be a thirty-five-year-old. Got to be a sixty-five-year-old. Um, there is, and and I just mentioned none of these candidates for the Eagles excite me. That doesn't mean that none of them can't be good. They could all be good. Uh, I don't think anybody really knows until you know, until you see guys do it. Um, but it is. It, it's to me. It's got more to do with the process. And I hate using that term, but I just used it, especially in Philadelphia. And and with the Eagles, if you go back to 2016 and you go back and you go to all these other teams as well, right now, typically when you're in a, a coaching search, you know you're going to fire your coach. In other words, um, whether it's you know somebody who fires their coach early, like the Eagles did in 2016 when uh, Chip Kelly was let go at the end of the season, Pat Shermer was the interim coach, or you just kind of know, like with four or five games left, like the Jets with Adam Gase, you know, well, we're not bringing this guy back. So <laughs> at that point, what happens is you get all your ducks in a row, so to speak. You know you're going to be hiring uh, a new head coach after the season. So – you're you're doing your due diligence. You're 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 putting together your list, and you're ready to go when that hiring cycle starts. In the case of the Eagles, this has been very scattershot. Very looks like they're throwing uh, darts at the dartboard, and I, I think that's the case. And I've said this uh, on on Sports Illustrated and some other platforms as well. They didn't think they'd be looking for a head coach. They made the decision and said, okay, we're going to bring Doug back. And and then after the season, the loggerheads developed over Press Taylor. And Jeffrey Jeffrey's assumption was, well, Doug will do what I ask, and he'll be back to coach this team. And, and then he stood on that hill and he defended it and said, nope, I'm not coming back unless – Press Taylor is my offense coordinator. Matt Burke's my defense coordinator, et cetera, et cetera. And Jeffrey said, no, I can't accept that. And they fired him. And all of a sudden, they had to look for a head coach. They weren't planning on looking for a head coach. So at that point, it becomes seat of the pants. Oh, okay, who are we going to talk to? And then you bring in early, you bring in the Salas, the Arthur Smiths, the guys you don't have a shot at. Uh, and then you got to start looking around. Okay, who else? And and I think that has sort of defined the scattershot approach. And it doesn't happen often. Normally, as I said, you're prepared. You understand you're going to fire your head coach. The Eagles didn't think they were going to fire their coach. 
that makes the argument for Deuce Staley even stronger in my mind, John. Yeah, I, I mean, the Eagles, <laughs> the Eagles are, are, are a bit weird uh, because they want certain things, and one of the things it seems really over the past two years is there was one outside voices. That was the, the demand last year was, no, you can't have micro. We need somebody outside the organization. We need new ideas. We need new uh, new, new voices. Um, this year it seems to be we, we need new ideas. We need new voices. And, oh, by the way, they can't come from the uh, Andy Reid tree because we've had too much of that, uh, which is, uh, I've said, is pretty stinking strange to me considering <laughs> the guy's getting ready for his third straight championship game and could go to the Super Bowl again. God forbid uh, if you have somebody learning under uh, Andy Reid. Um, so I don't understand that part of it. But, you know, Jeffrey Lurie is Jeffrey Lurie at this stage, and there's some there's some quirks. Um, and that's been a definition of this as well. The interesting thing to me, and this has been reported in, in a number of places, and it was a little bit shocking to me. I assumed um, Jeffrey would be the one that, that would fall for Josh McDaniels because um, of his love of the Patriots and Bill Belichick and um, thinking he's got sort of Bill Belichick, Bill Belichick Jr. Um, it's actually Howie Roseman. He's pushing for Josh McDaniels, which is really strange. So, I mean, the Eagles are throwing curveballs all over this place. And I, I think I go back to my original thought because they weren't prepared for this. And everybody's just flying by the seat of their pants. So if they weren't prepared for this, I mean, the the locker room had to have been taken off guard, at least to a certain degree, up to a up to a certain point. So I, I go back to an outside hire, a point that you just bring up. That seems risky to me as well, because now you're bringing in a guy who hasn't been around this team and all these guys are used to Doug. They're used to Doug's coaching staff, certain voices and. Maybe some guys are excited for a fresh voice. I'm sure some guys are. There's 53 guys in that locker room. There's always going to be some that want a different voice. But there's just more risk involved. So once again, do Staley, at least you know, consensus in that locker room, they're going to be excited for him. They're going to play hard for him. Josh McDaniels, you have to expect some side eyes and some things go the wrong way early in that tenure. <laughs> we, we know how that story is going to end. Yeah, and, and it comes down to it, it. It's pretty clear and it's pretty evident at this stage. They don't think Deuce Staley is the head coach. Uh, I mean, that's what it comes down to. And, and they think Josh McDaniels is. And um, I don't I don't think that's a very popular take. Not that you need to be popular. You know? The old cliche is true. I mean, yeah. It, the minute you listen to the fans, you're going to be sitting with the fans. In other words, you're going to get fired. Well, you know, the owner's not going to get fired, but you get the point. Um, so it, it's not uh, necessarily um, agreeing uh, with the popular path or agreeing with the fans or what they would like, or even the players, uh, because obviously they like Deuce personally, uh, so many of them. So that's not the issue I have, but uh, the issue I have is this constant default to, look, you know, Jeffrey was the one who, who called this stinking thing the gold standard when Andy was here, which obviously he got a lot of criticism for. But it wasn't far from the truth, to be honest. Um, you know, probably the silver standard or, or the bronze standard. Uh, would have been a better definition uh, with the Patriots around. But nonetheless, what what is true, what is completely true, is this was a really, really well-regarded organization around the National Football League. 
as we sit here today, I can't say that. So, I, I mean, Jeffrey's got to know that. I, Je- Jeffrey's got to understand. Look at Sean Payton, the little dig. Uh, uh, I don't know if you saw that when when somebody asked him uh, about uh, the Eagles and how they do things, and he, uh, and he kind of backhanded him and said, I, I don't think about the Eagles at all doing anything. Now, he's very good friends with with Doug Peterson, so maybe it was just about, you know, his friend getting fired, but you get my point. Yeah. Um, this this was once, um, you know, a high standard, uh, certainly one of the top five thought-of organizations in this league, and now it's not. And it's not because they want – Away from the only time it's not is when they go away from Andy Reid, and I know people don't like that. In in 49 states in this country, which is ironic, uh, I shouldn't say for the Delaware Valley, so we'll take out three. Uh, so say 47 states in this country, Andy Reid is a a, a phenomenal coach, uh, a first ballot Hall of Famer, and in the Delaware Valley where he, you know. <laughs> did his most brilliant work, to be honest, uh, even though he didn't get the Super Bowl, um, they think he's not. And it's always been bizarre to me. It will always be this bizarre to me. Um, they went away from him with Chip Kelly. And I'm not arguing. Everybody's got a shelf life. Look, if we go back in hindsight, guess what? You should have fought through that. This Pro football, like all sports, is cyclical. Could you imagine if Andy Reid is still the coach here? This is still a top-notch organization. But I'm not even arguing that because, again, at times some people need changes of scenery, and obviously it worked out really well for Andy. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is you got the down in Chip Kelly. Not that Chip was a bad coach, but he was a bad guy. He didn't get along with people. Organization took a hit. Then they go back to the Andy sort of method with Doug Peterson. You go back up, you spike, um, you, but you have that cycle uh, because the personnel goes down and they overreacted. And here we are again. We're looking for outside voices and this and that. And they're trying to get away from Andy Reid again. Why? Why are you running away from Andy Reid? You should be running towards Andy Reid. <laughs> I, I joke this, this, I wrote in Philly Voice this week, this should have been the easiest coaching search in history. Jeff Lurie picks up the phone, calls Andy, and says, Eric Bieniemy or Mike Kafka, who should I hire? Right. Yeah. That should have been it. Should be that simple. I mean, you bring up a point where well, – let's go back for a second to – the Eagles parting ways with Andy Reid and, and that relationship mutually coming to an end, however we want to officially deem that. But we can maybe point to that as the beginning of the, the turn and downfall from Jeffrey Lurie in particular, because everything that you just detailed on the timeline, it, it just it makes a lot of sense. Like, I, can you refresh our memories as to the breaking point or points uh, as to why Andy Reid's tenure came to an end in Philadelphia? Well, the breaking point was, uh, you know, 4-12. and 12. I, I, I mean, it was a disastrous season. It, it, it was a bad, uh, certainly one of the worst seasons in the Jeffrey Lurie era. Um, and it was after 14 years. So um, you have all those heights and all those championship games, but ultimately ending up in disappointment and only the one Super Bowl, which I kind of laugh at, but uh, nonetheless, it's really hard to win all those playoff games. It's really hard to go to all those NFC championship games. Uh, But again, football is always cyclical. We saw it with Bill Belichick this year. Ultimately, uh, you're going to have to rebuild. Jeffrey calls it a transition. Um, and it would have been interesting to see if the Eagles would have fought that uh, would have fought that out, so to speak, and said, "You know what? We did have a bad team. We didn't have talent, but Andy's a really good coach, uh, and let's just keep going in this direction." 
wouldn't have been popular at the time. People wanted him out of here. But again, sometimes you you got to fight through it. The, the Steelers did it with Bill Cowher. You know, Bill didn't win a Super Bowl for all those years, and people were saying, you got to get him out of here. And, and it's stagnant, and all of a sudden it clicks and they win. Um, that might have happened here if they fall through it. But again, I, I don't even blame them for that. Um, you know, at that point, maybe because of the, also the off-the-field issues with his family, uh, maybe Andy wanted out of here himself. Um but, you know, I, I, I think after the Chip Kelly mistake, and I, I don't even point to that because, you know, Chip won 10 games twice. Um, I think people uh, underrate what kind of coach he was. I think his problems were um, see, trying to seize too much power, uh, not getting along with people, as I said, uh, and ultimately not adjusting. Um, and certainly didn't communicate with, with Howie Roseman and Jeffrey Lurie, uh, and that fractured that relationship. Um, they should have learned from that, and they obviously have it. And, and then, you know, it almost becomes the Doug Peterson era is the anomaly because they didn't want him. Let's be honest. They didn't want him. They wanted to hire Adam Gase, and they couldn't get Adam Gase, and they wanted to hire Ben McAdoo, and they couldn't get Ben McAdoo, and they settled for Doug Peterson. And it becomes very evident from that point. In hindsight, they never trusted him. Even though he won a Super Bowl, they didn't allow him to pick his own assistant coaches. Now, Doug never pushed for personnel, right? So in a lot of ways, it was perfect for, for Howie Roseman uh, because he had a coach that wasn't going to – push for personnel power and just wanted a voice in the process. Um, and it still didn't work out. Uh, and they're going in this different direction. And and how do you, you know, it's going to be interesting when Josh gets this job. And again, I, I, I believe Josh McDaniels will be the next head coach of this team. Um, he's going to have more power than Andy Reid ever had. Hmm. How, how, how do you defend that? If you're Jeffrey Glory, the answer is he doesn't have to because it's his team. And that, by the way, is completely true. But it, it, it tells you all you need to know. And the fact that what, what does that mean about the psyche of Jeffrey Glory? To me, it means he thinks he's responsible for Super Bowl 52, not Doug Peterson. He thinks he won Super Bowl 52 despite Doug Peterson. It's I disagree a, with that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, come on. And you're about to give this guy, Josh McDaniels, I say this guy, I don't mean it to be whatever, but you're about to give him a ton of personnel responsibility. Well, how how is that going to work with Howie? Well, Howie seems on board, which is the strange part, and that's what I said earlier in this conversation. You know, yeah. Howie seems to be the one. Howie. If it were up to Howie, Josh McDaniels would already be the coach of this team. They wouldn't be going through these hoops uh, and trying to do the due diligence. Jeff's the one that's got to be convinced, uh, and that's really interesting because, uh, it, you know, Josh Josh McDaniel, when he was 33 in Denver, he got uh, Bill Belichick level power. Uh, he ran the whole show, which, which was. You know, probably the biggest mistake in Denver Bronco history, um, because he just wasn't prepared for it. Now, in the in the past years, he he's done interviews and and said he's learned a lot from his mistakes, and doesn't want that all all powerful autonomy uh, because he knows the job is too big. Uh, so I, I don't think he, he's pushing to that level. Uh, but he does want to have a more significant voice than than Doug Peterson, certainly. And I think ultimately he might even get power over the final 53, um, which, by the way, is overrated. I say that all the time. It is completely overrated. It's not that big of a deal. When you're talking about power over the final 53, you might disagree on one or two players. And, and at the worst, three in a really bad year. So it's not that big of a deal. But it is uh, sort of a symbol. And again, 
how do you define, how do you defend that symbol uh, when you were so stringent about Doug Peterson? Again, the personnel to me is not as big as the coaching staff because Doug didn't, didn't care as much. Uh, and that probably, when he, he thinks about this, he'll probably say, I should have cared a little bit more. But nonetheless, um, I imagine he will have uh, a lot more input on his assistant coaches. And again, what, what is Josh McDaniels? And, and if it's somebody else, too, um, what have they done for this organization versus, you know, the head coach you just fired? It's really a strange situation. And again, this was considered a top tier organization in the Andy Reid era, and for most of the Doug Peterson era. It is not, it was not considered a top-tier organization at the end of the Chip Kelly era and right now. I, I, <laughs> and they don't seem to understand why. It's unbelievable. No one understands why. Uh, we'll be talking about it every night right here on The Fix at 1030. Follow John at J.F. McMullen on Twitter, phillyvoice.com, si.com, and host of Extending the Play every Saturday at 10 a.m. John, thank you, my friend, and we'll do it again tomorrow night. All right. Thanks, Ryan. See you, John. Good stuff from Johnny Mac. All right. Let's get to a break and get into the second hour. When we come back, I'll react to all of that.